that was it. We went through, we went through all the capillary beds. Uh, you know, I didn't talk specifically too much about these walls right here because I've recorded the lectures and I talk about them slower and in more detail. So, but if anybody has any particular questions, if you've gone over them, discuss any about these vessel wall layers and the differences in between the different types of vessels, what you might find. Yeah, so, you know, in the, in the video and stuff, we're, you know, just thinking about the layers, the wall, like when somebody says they have plaque buildup, right, what does it mean? Like, is it something like uh, if you have a clogged drain or something stuck to the outside or something like that, or is it something different? What do you mean when you say the art, you know, the vessel wall, right, is clogged, right? And what we'll see is that these kind of plaques, these fatty buildup are actually inside the vessel, right? So you can't just go in there and like scrape it out. Right? You got to kind of dig in underneath the actual epithelial and connective tissue under there because these buildups are happening inside the vessel wall. There's two things going on with uh, this plaque buildup. First off, there's some kind of damage, right? You have the so-called endothelial, you know, these skimple squamous cells creating a nice, clear, smooth laminal flow of blood go through here. But if there's any kind of damage, which you might get under high stress over there, like in your LAD, for instance, the Widowmaker, uh, any kind of opening here is gonna cause a inflammation response. And something really weird, you know, that I can't really explain happens, but the number one, the immune, the causing this inflammation. And then for some reason, your smooth muscles proliferate. They become increased in this area. The macrophages, right, the immune cells, they start chomping on that LD, the, that uh, LDL, right? Low density lipid lipoproteins, it's your cholesterol does. basically, right? That's carrying cholesterol. They start eating them for some reason. They just start chomping away, but then they just get big and fat and they love them. So that's the actual plaque right there, these foam cells. That's the combination of the plaque right there. It's part of an immune response, part of an inflammation response, macrophages chomping down. The more LDL you have in your system, this is why cholesterol can be bad for you. If you don't have damage to the walls, cholesterol is not so bad. But once you do, these macrophages are what's chomping on them, eating them, filling up with them, becoming these big fat foam cells inside your vessel wall. So you have a blockage now right, of blood flow through there, which is going to decrease your blood flow down to your, if this is the case of the LAD, right, down to your apex, right, down to your ventricle wall right there. And then the other part of it is if these plaques break free and then continue on the circulation as they move toward those smaller arteries and arterioles, they're going to clog up. Or if they go up to your brain and then they go up into the smaller blood vessels of your brain, right? That's when you start to get those, those chunks sticking and blocking the entire blood flow. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on that, but that's my general understanding of what, what's going on. Uh, but that would be that would be happening just under your tunica intima. And then it gets kind of combined with your tunica media, the next muscular layer over here. This is the deepest layer, endothelial cells, simple squamous, nice laminal blood flow. And you'll have the basal lamina and arteries are gonna have that elastic membrane around that Swiss cheese looking thing. And then your tunica media layer, your tunica media, right? that's the muscular layer, smooth muscle, uh, controlled by your sympathetic nervous system as far as constriction and dilation. And your arteries are also going to have that extra Swiss cheese right over here, your elastic membrane on the outside, right? So when we say vasoconstriction, this is controlling the blood flow through here by, you know, when you squeeze this, remember, you're increasing the pressure going through there. So if you needed to move it like up towards your head, you might want to do that, right? So vasoconstriction, that's your tunica media, thicker in your thickest, in our thick, much thicker in arteries and veins and much thicker in your are your muscular arteries than your elastic arteries, which are going to be a little heavier on the elastic part of it. So the tunica media is the portion which is the thicker in artery, or is it the same? And the one which is so like but this. I feel like I'm hearing it but not understanding it. <laughs> yeah. So here are these elastic arteries over here, right? You know, you have the lumen of you have the whole vessel, right? Maybe your corresponding veins and artery, this is maybe wider. It has a wider lumen, 
but overall the wall is thinner and especially that tunica media right mm -hmm. in any vein versus artery and then within your arteries you know this is more concerned with that remember stretch and recoil part although you do have a tunica media and the lumen is bigger than in your muscular one right but these are okay. thicker these have the thickest walls and they have and most of that is due to your all of it really is due to the thicker muscular layer the tunica media okay and, and the then, lumen is specifically the in the only the part that the blood is in contact with right yeah that's okay. the lumen right just like when we get to our digestive tract this will be the lumen of your digestive tract or the lumen yeah. of your bronchi the air is going through the food is going through the blood is going through and that's you know you can see this big wide one right? even though the wall is much thinner that's why it's all floppy like that mm -hmm. the muscular portion isn't as big of a factor as like as these over here yeah and you'll be able to see that histologically speaking and so your tunica media and then the adventitia so-called that's the connective tissue layer that you can visibly see on the outside right it's going to be connecting you know like i said the veins and arteries and different arteries and veins and nerves to neurovascular bundles they're all kind of stuck together going to the same regions of the body so all these connective tissue layers will not only protect the whole thing but also can i connect all those together in the biggest vessels you notice over here it's got its own blood supply to it that'll be the vaso vasorum so that's the adventitia outside there then in elastic fibers this is much more elastic and elastic sorry arteries that's much more elastic than any of the other ones so those are the layers and this is you know a couple of the pictures of that the adventitia around here the separation between that and again once you get into a tissue uh, once you get into sorry an organ the actual place where you're getting close to the capillary bed you can lose that and just be because you're it's really no different from the surrounding area. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, that would be this is the big picture. You could totally lose it and then lose that tunica media as you become a capillary. Because your whole purpose is not to have to go through a muscular layer, but to exchange stuff with the you know surrounding interstitium. So the large vein is analogous to the elastic artery, and that would be well, stuff like. I would say that you know, I, you know, this is the aorta. This is your superior vena cava. Mm -hmm. Your inferior vena cava is moving alongside your abdominal aorta, and you know, your medium size, you know, your sub, your axillary is running alongside that, and so they're they're roughly, you know, they're going to and from the same places, but you know, you see the the change over here isn't super great, right? These are just basically more passive holders of blood and like flowing mm -hmm. through these are much more active okay. between them i wouldn't ask you to differentiate between a large and a medium-sized vein for instance right i would just ask you to differentiate between a vein and an artery and then lecture wise just know the differences basically so the is there a difference between a simple systemic circuit and a systemic circuit because in no, yellow I mean, this the systemic circuit is blood flow from the heart to the tissues right Mm -hmm. and back that's the systemic circuit so your portal vein is part of your systemic circuit it's just differentiating from the pulmonary circuit and then a simple a simple circuit is just that normal artery capillary art vein thing and then there's a couple of modified ones like those anastomoses as well as the portal vein but they're all within the systemic circuit mm -hmm. so we started out, you know, talking about breathing in air, right? We talked about it going through your nasal cavity lined with that pseudo stratified ciliated cum epithelia that was picking up anything you breathe in, but it was also warming the air, humidifying, right? Conditioning the air so that it was optimal for gas exchange when it did get down into your alveolar. And that those blood vessels, remember, that was warming the stuff and the mucus layer that was humidifying. That's also where your olfactory epithelium was up at the top right there so you could pick up stuff that you are smelling and you said it was the stratified pseudo stratified, pseudo -stratified. ciliated come to your you're, you're in a okay got it i remember you're in a protected space at this point that's how you want to think of epithelial right what is it doing outside here this is stratified squamous 
in your vestibule as it enters your nose where all the nose hair is and stuff. Then as it gets in, where they're trying to get that cotton swab up there, uh, you're in a protected area, right? You're inside your skull basically at this point. So you could go to a simple epithelial layer. It's much more delicate than that stratified squamous because it doesn't have fingers and stuff going up in it, right? So mm -hmm. you can go to a simple delicate layer, but now you want the function of it to be that ciliated stuff that has that mucus layer on top right there. So you can move stuff out, the stuff that you does get stuck in that layer, you can beat out through the cilia thing down in the back of your throat, and then you could swallow it or spit it out or sneeze it out, right? That's why you, so that's that whole purpose of that. So any area that's protected from fingers and food and stuff like that is going to be up here is going to be that pseudostratified. That's the respiratory epithelium, so-called pseudostratified ciliated coma. And the key is ciliated. Going through your nasal circulation, there's a little bit of this nasal pharynx that's still stratified because we're not in a food area and then this whole area over here is going to be where boluses are going down pressing up against this so this all becomes a stratified squamous again and this whole area and what's your mouth is going to be also what's your what's this structure over here what was it for all right your uvula or soft palate it's gonna, is that like that little tongue thingy? That's that little thing that you, when you say, open your mouth and say, ah, that's dangling. That's that. Okay. That closes when you're swallowing food to block anything from going up into your nasal cavity, right? Remember laughing milk or sewed out your nose, right? That failed when that happened. Because stuff went into your area right here. All right, so that's stratified squamous. And now once you get when the food goes down, it, your epiglottis, right, above your glottis is going to close. Right? It's to prevent to push food down your esophagus, right, which is gonna be lined with, you know, stratified squamous, but we don't have to be concerned about that yet. Right? But it's gonna be pushed down there, but now you're in air only, right? Back to air only, right? Air only, mm -hmm. air only. And that means that it is, you know, Pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial. Columnar epithelial. And then now you're back to it down here, all the way down until you get to your smallest bronchioles, right? It makes sense why, right? Yeah, why you go from one to the other. Yeah, it does. Here, we're going to change. And then the next layer we're going to be concerned with the next epithelia we're going to be lay concerned with is that simple squamous once we get down in the alveoli we're not going to worry about the transition about that okay professor the yeah. hard palate it's formed by the bones and then the soft is by the squamous right uh, okay. yeah the hard palate is part is the roof of your mouth basically okay. up here and then this is just like a dangling there's a little bit of you know connective tissue and skin and stuff and muscle uh, around this, not skin, but you know, lining. This would be a stratified squamous on this side, probably a pseudo-stratified. I'm not sure, but don't worry about it. All right, but that's just the flap. And you could you, know, you could see it. If you open up your mouth and look in the back of your throat right there, that's what it is. And it's very, you know, loose. And that just pushes up against there, preventing stuff from going here. This is, has a little more structure, right? That has that elastic cartilage in it. That's going to flop over this whole thing and really close this path through off. This is much more of a danger, gravity, and you know the force of the food being pushed down this way. Normally, it isn't being pushed up that way anyway. So this has a little bit more structure. And then you get through your epiglottis, right? And then you have your larynx area with your voice box and all the structures going through there. And then you get into your trachea over here, which is going to have that ring or partially, like not totally not enclosed ring. That's going to hold this piece of cartilage is going to hold this open right? and contracts to your esophagus, which is going to expand and contract based on muscular contractions and food being pushed down, right? This always has to be kept open. Your air is not going to be pushing over any tube. So this structure over here is going to keep that open all the way down, all the way down through your bronchi, 
right? As it moves through, you see these cartilage rings hope, holding open your airways. And so this is what's going through your lungs. And then you have on the outside surface, you could see the lobes, right? Three on the right, two on the left, separated by those fissures. And then these branches of the bronchi, which still have the cartilage, are going to branch off into your right and left main bronchi and then go into your lobar bronchi. Right, and blue here, two, superior and inferior lobe, superior, middle, and inferior lobe. And then within your lobe, they'll break off into little segments because remember the compartmentalization, right? You'd have a bunch of segments within each lobe, which have this, there's a compartmentalization to it. So if you get some kind of bad thing over here, it doesn't necessarily spread to these or to your other lobes right there. It's actually usually happening down here for some reason. But those are, that's your bronchi, right? And your smaller bronchi, they branch off and they break off. They're still held open by the cartilage all the while. What are they lined with? Pseudostilated. Pseudostratified. Yeah. What's their function, right? You want to keep anything that you did breathe in either through your nose, you could push out and either spit out or swallow. Up here, that cilia is beating it up, right? Out here and down into here again to be spit out. Right? All these little, little poopies over here that you see stuck in the mucous membrane. The cilia is beating it. Mucus is formed by your goblet cells and your mucus glands. So it's stratified. Mucociliary transport, getting it away from your alveoli, basically. When this is paralyzed by like smoking, let's say, or excess mucus or thick mucus, as in cystic fibrosis, right? this whole transport chain has been hampered with. And you know, you get excess clog and all the stuff that you did breathe starts heading down toward your alveoli. Right. And so once you're in your tubes over there, your airway tubes, again, you might have things like bronchitis over here, which is going to cause an inflammation decreasing the airway passage, right? Same kind of thing we'll be seeing, you know, in your blood vessels, right? Decreased blood flow due to blockage of this, either due to inflammation or fluid buildup. So the cartilage is gonna hold it open to some, to some extent. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, what would be the structure of this? Do we? Uh, we didn't be, talk about do the We don't layer, have to go over that. But it would be an epithelial layer. Uh, a connective tissue, a muscular layer, and then the cartilage. Mm -hmm. But you'd have those same kind of named layers everywhere. You know, all your tubes of your bodies are going to have that kind of same structure, epithelial, okay. connective tissue, muscular. In this case, the only muscular, the only thing we're concerned about is the epithelial lining of that tube. Mm -hmm. In this case, we'll still be stratified because they're still in the bronchi. And... Uh, some places, you know, the muscular layer, once you lose this cartilage, as you get into closer to your air sacs and to your bronchioles, you've lost the cartilage. And this will allow kind of uh, the control of airflow into the lungs, right? So you can kind of squeeze these off and kind of slow down air, because you don't always need a lot of, you know, if you don't need it, then you want to conserve the energy so you can kind of restrict airflow to where you need it, right? But it also, in asthma, these are what are constricting, and that's what you have to relieve that constriction to fully kind of open up these airways, right? You also have inflammation and mucus buildup, but the asthma, these bronchioles, without the cartilage, are particularly vulnerable to asthma. Um, and this is the muscle which is not conscious control, right? Yeah, this is like all you... muscle stuff. Everything we're, we're going to talk about from now on, is going to be smooth. We already went cardiac muscle, smooth muscle. This is mm -hmm. all based on, this is all actually a parasympathetic response. So when you do asthma, there's certain you know, drugs, medicine that blocks the parasympathetic receptors. And then mm -hmm. that loosens that constriction up. Okay. Yeah, that's all unconscious based on your oxygen needs and situation right there. Cool. You can loosen or contract them. Same with blood vessels. All right, so you've moved in, right? You've gone down these cartilage rings over here, the structures that branch off and branch off until you get to those tiny little millions and millions and millions of little air sacs. 
what are those little millions and millions of little air sacs versus one big thing, dude? Increasing the surface area from a newspaper to a tennis court or a half a tennis court, right? So you're massively increasing your respiratory exchange membrane through these alveoli, right? So for histology purposes, you know, this is kind of what you're looking at. Here's your bronchioli right over here, this cross section. These over here are these alveoli. You can't really make out an alveolar sac per se, but also what you can't really also make out is all these little blood vessels that are running alongside them. But that's kind of what you're looking at with this big mess right here. Wait, so I, I missed it. That big blob, which is there, right that's the bronchioli? Yeah, that would be this, right? So remember when you're making these, you know, they make these cuts, right? Mm -hmm. they're gonna they're gonna do like you know cut like this or something so you're gonna mm -hmm. get some of this maybe maybe a blood vessel within it maybe a bigger bronchi but you know cross section you're gonna have this is this right here and then these over here are all these right over here right these are the little air sacs and the fact that you can't see any cartilage around this piece means you're looking at a bronchioli not a bronchi. So that one lung section in the histology thing, you just look for cartilage and then you just label it as a bronchi. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, what if the bron what if the cartilage is over there? I'm not going to do that. There's no cartilage. It's a bronchi. It's a bronchioli. And then these are alveoli. Simple. Mm -hmm. All right. So Bronchi versus bronchioli. Bronchioli, right? Okay. Artery versus arterioli, right? Same, same uh, pattern, right? It's a, mm -hmm. a diminutive term, something smaller. Right? And then we get into the actual final gas exchange surface, right? where you know you have oxygen breathed in, and it's going to go pass through your simple squamous layer of your alveoli into the simple squamous layer of your blood vessel, right? Where these blood cells are gonna pick up the oxygen and drop off the CO2. Okay. This respiratory exchange membrane, very small, very short, uh, very short distance for rapid gas exchange moving through here. You also had macrophages in here that would start the immune response or eat up any particles that made it through. And remember, you also had um, the lining of fluid, right, lining the cells over here because gas and stuff does not diffuse through air. I mean, it diffuses, but it won't diffuse through a cell membrane. So because you had those cells, You had this water that would stick together. You have these surfactant cells that were sur that were making surfactant so that they would reduce break that surface tension. That was what was going on in the alveoli. What are the green things? Uh, these would be the let's see. So the blue ones would be the macrophages. The green ones would be the ones that are secreting the surfactant. Oh, okay. Those are the type two alveolar cells. Do we need to know those? Yeah, they're surfactant. Okay. Not to identify them, but their function of them. You know, oh, why, oh, okay. Why do you need surfactant here? You know, and these are the type one cells. These are the type two cells, and then there are the macrophages. I just okay. usually label them as you know the surfactant yeah. cells. That's more important, just to know the the function of this, right? What happens if you don't have it? For instance, if you're a premature baby. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, what happens is this, you have a collapsed alveoli, right? Premature babies are not producing surfactant because they're not supposed to be, according to nature, out in the world yet, right? So they're not prepared for that and they don't have surfactant, their lungs collapse. Here's another picture over here. Who can guess what this would be an example of? Here is your alveoli in this picture. Here's the alveoli in another one. Which respiratory disease might this be? Which one was supposed to be the normal one? The one on the, yeah. okay. So 
assuming that these are the same scale, which is an important thing, right? These are the same scale. Oh, yeah, so what do we see in here? How much, which one has more room for, how, which one has more gas exchange opportunity, A uh, or B? B. Right, so what has happened over here? Instead of, you know, 10, 15 little alveoli, you get this one big thing over here. What, what disease is this? Could it be like um, emphysema or? Exactly, pneumonia? emphysema. That is the answer. That's the only answer. Breakdown of alveolar walls. So that's what you'd be looking at right here. Let's break down the walls right here to get, instead of one, a bunch of little grapes, you have one big single grape sack with a reduced gas exchange opportunity. So, you know, the other thing about emphysema, like this would be, you know, again, her, as you see how the bunch, nice, a lot of gas exchange, and then this right here, right? The other thing about it, sort of counterintuitive, is that you could actually breathe in easier, just like you could breathe air into an old balloon easier, right? But then when you, when you let that air out, the recoil is gonna be so much less that it takes energy to kind of breathe out, right? So it's actually easier to breathe in, you know, it's easier to blow up an old balloon. But the, the big problem is that you have to go, like kind of breathe out at that point when the alveolar wall is broken down. So your alveolar walls and your elastic fibers. All right, and then the other one is pneumonia, right? This is what most people of respiratory infections actually die of, fluid buildup, either from fluid floating down over here or being made over here, less room for gas exchange. And eventually it fills up completely and you have less and less gas exchange area. Or I guess if you were drowning or something, this would be something similar. All right, so that's the lungs, right? And these, these are the vessels going into the lungs, right? You got the, what are these right here? They, no, not. The pulmonary trunk? Pulmonary. Yeah, well, coming off the pulmonary trunk, to be specific, is the right and left. Right and left. It's a vein. Um, Why right is it? Vein, pulmonary vein. Okay. Then what are these right here? So the, the red and blue here are indicating oxygen aided blood and deoxidated. So your aorta and your, your aorta obviously has got oxygenated blood in it. And your vena cava obviously is deoxygenated. But that's your systemic circuit. Why are we pumping blood into the lungs? For it to become oxygenated. Become oxygenated. And if a vessel is leaving the heart, what is it called? An artery. An artery. Mm -hmm. So this is your pulmonary arteries, right? Even though they're blue. Remember that change in the, you know, arteries always away, right? Yeah. So it doesn't matter so much the oxygenation status, although, you know, it's consistent within your systemic circuit that your arteries are carrying oxygenated blood and your veins are carrying deoxygenated. But in your pulmonary, it's the opposite. So these are your pulmonary veins putting blood your right and left pulmonary veins dumping back into your left atrium. Yeah. Right where these are coming, coming from the pulmonary trunk, and these are going into your right atrium. That would be your heart stuff. Okay, and then your heart. So we got a lot of questions about this. You got to understand blood flow through the heart. Right, where does it start? What's this, see how thin this thing is right here? See how thin it is compared to your vessel wall here, right? Sequence of events, right? Deoxygenated blood, and of course it's gonna be coming from down below too, entering your right atrium. Which valve does it enter through here? Superior vena cava. Uh, so what's the valve? Oh, the valve is the... Uh, um... Or is there any? Or is that a trick question? N no, I don't know. <laughs> No. There's no valves. There's no valves uh, for the veins going into your atriums, either on the pulmonary or these. Okay, that there's no valves. It's just dumping right in. Yeah. That's your question. Right, but from your right atrium, right, this is the oracle out here. 
it's going to go through your what's this valve called right here? Atrioventricular um, tricuspid valve. A B valve, right? You can call it the tricuspid or the right A B valve. Yeah. Either one will work. And then you get into your right ventricle, right? And so we know the right ventricle, even if this were flipped around, right, is much the wall over here much thinner than the left one. Left one, right? That's obvious in this picture. And just while we're here talking about walls, everybody knows the epi, uh, the myocardium, and the endocardium. Over here are the layers of the wall, basically. This is your muscular layer. That'll be the myocardium. Once it goes through that AV valve, where's it going next? After it goes through the AV valve, it semi goes up through the ocean. Oh, What's this valve it. called? The semilunar um, pulmonary. Yeah, yeah. Pulmonary or pulmonary semilunar. Yeah. And into the... And then into the pulmonary trunk, yeah. right? Yeah, which is going to go into your right and left lungs right there, pulmonary arteries. Okay, so, oh, that just finally clicked for me how that works. Huh. Yeah, so this is the, you know, we're just tracing a drop of blood as it goes to the heart. And we'll always yeah. remember that, of course, this uh, simultaneously, it's happening on the other side, that blood is going in, you know, from over there somewhere in the back of the lungs into through your pulmonary veins right, into your left atrium that's your left oracle but that's the left atrium yeah is there any valve here no right and then what's the next valve over here mitral uh, mitral valve or the left av or your bicuspid right bicuspid bicuspid that's another name for it so left atrium yeah. dumps into the left ventricular, left ventricle, and then it's going to be pumped out. You can't see it. It's going to be on here. Into is it not the aortic valve? It is the aortic valve, right? Aortic valve. It's the aortic. They're named after the vessel, right? Pulmonary valve, aortic valve. It's as simple as that. Okay. Into your aorta. Wait, wait, wait. So the mitral bicuspid valve. That's this. Is the one that is from the atri atrium into the ventricle. Right. That's why it may be beneficial to think of them as the AV valves, right? Atrioventricular valves. Okay. That shows you. And then these are named after the vessels, right? Mm -hmm. That's how I have to picture them so I don't confuse them. Yeah, right. But everybody, I want to kind of stress uh, mitral just because clinically, you know, the, this side is really the important side here. This is what where things go wrong off because of the greater kind of pressures it's facing and everything. So there's there's all sorts of, you know, left. There's It's much more common. Your mitral valve, your aortic valve are much more prone to damage. Mm -hmm. Your replacement. All right. So definitely say to yourself, draw it out all the sequence of blood flow as it goes through, you know, whether it's oxygenated, which compartment it's oxygenated in, where it's going through, and then what these valves are for, right? What are they for? Remember, we, we just went through this venous return, right? Those valves that blood was pushed up, they're one-way valves that prevented okay. backflow. Yeah. And that's the big picture. They prevent backflow and they're open and closed due to pressure differences. Yeah. These valves. What about the tricuspid and the mitral valves? Because those, those look like they function differently from the semilunar valves. There, that's the trick. They actually don't, but they do have these excess structures right here, right? They have the mm -hmm. papillary muscles and the chordae tendinae. These valves still open and close. They open like a trap door due to pressure, you know, greater pressure here than here. And when the vessels contract, they slam shut, right? In fact, the lub dub thing is your lub, your semi-lunar valves, the dub is your AV valves, right? That's the slamming shut of them, okay? They slam shut based on the squeezing up because you wanna, you wanna squeeze blood out the aorta, not back into the atrium, right? What these are for, right? Your papillary muscles come out of your myocardium. They contract with the myocardium so that when they do close and when there's all this pressure against them, they keep them closed. 
They don't close them. They just keep them close from blowing from prolapse. That was so, my question. I, I was really confused with that. I was, do they pull like when it, when the might when it contracts, do the papillary like close them or because uh, I because if, if, yeah. if you think about it, you know the uh, you know the valves are like hanging down, right? And blood flow is going through them. When when they when there's a whole bunch of pressure coming from up here, on my drawings here. Uh, when they're coming, you know, when they are, you know, they so they open up when blood is, you know, pressure here is greater than pressure here. Yeah, they've mm -hmm. they've opened up to that, and that's in this situation. And then in the next situation, all of a sudden you've contracted, and the pressure is much greater up here. That forces the valves to slam shut over here and prevent blood flow, you know, being going here and direct it out toward the aortic valve. Okay. So they'll close due to that, just like your veins, your, you know, your vein, your, the valves in your vein will close yeah. or these will close. But the pressure here is so great that they would push it, actually blow these back open if you want okay. for your papillary muscles because they contract and they pull it down. They're actually pulling against the pressure. Yeah. Right? They're pulling in the opposite direction to keep them from going back in. And that's the whole purpose of those. Are the cord <laughs> I, I, I don't think you're gonna ask this, but I just have a question. The cord cordae tendon, are they um, tendons? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're kind of like, you know, if this was your biceps breakout, you have the tendons merging off them. They're kind of a similar structure that they, they're connective tissue. They're going to be covered in, you know, endothelial stuff, but they are, you know, a kind of a connective tissue tendon that's mm -hmm. going to do that, right? And that's another thing I'll bring up here is I didn't really talk about it in the Zoom, but, you know, look at the whole fibrous layer and the functions of the fibrous layer of the heart, uh, you know, what the functions of that were. And that was one of them. They kind of merged to form these tendons right here. They're also, you know, providing like any connective tissue it's providing a route. They provide this whole structure over here. That's where the valves come off of, right? You have this whole atrioventricular kind of septum and the connective tissue reinforces the valves around here, all the valves. And they also, the third thing the connective tissue does is insulate the conduction uh, cells, right? Those cells that are passing that signal down here so that you're insulating your atrial and your ventricular compartment as well as as it moves down here because that one pathway as it moves down here before it contracts. And I'll, I'll talk about that in the next slide right there. Do this whole picture over and over again in your head until you get it straight. Left, mm -hmm. right side of the heart is all deoxygenated. Left side is all oxygenated. Top infer, superior portion is your receiving chambers. Sup, inferior portion is your pumping chambers. So there are a couple of ways, two different ways to divide it. The sequence of contraction though, is what, right? We're gonna look through as the heart pumps, this signal in purple is indicating the electrical signal. And of course, as the electrical signal is going through, it's also the contraction, All right? So it starts in your SA node, up here that pacemaker cells, pacemaker cells, pacemaker cells are the SA node. That'll be a question. That'll be a question on your T's exam, everywhere else go. Pace, what are the pacemaker cells, the SA node? Those are the ones that set the pace. Signal spreads throughout the atrium. And because it's you know separated by that connective tissue, it doesn't spread down here. They're all kind of a unit up here. And it spreads through and it contracts, it pushes blood into here. It also reaches that signal, also reaches there are these bundles. These uh, these all don't worry about these, but there's a connection over here which reaches this second bundle, the AV bundle, right? Separating the atrium and the ventricles location. That one is going to send that signal down the interventricular septum, isolated, not contracting, until it reaches the apex and goes to those Purkinje fibers, which are going to cause that signal to go up in these muscle cells to contract in an upward fashion, pushing the blood up out those pulmonary and aortic valves right there. Where would I find this again in the text or what slide is, not slide, um, 
lecture. This was in, you know, the last, the first heart lecture. We went heart through. lecture. I went over it in the Zoom, but it's also all in the videos and stuff. Okay. It's also um, on the cardio worksheets. Oh, okay, yeah. So I put some extra stuff on the worksheet that you can. How did I yeah. not ever understand this properly so far into the class? It's, oh. it, uh, it'll, it comes to you after a while. You know, first, you know, there's two, because there's two separate things going on, right? When I talk mm -hmm. about blood flow through the heart, we kind of trace a passive blood on the right side, going to the lungs, and then on the left side. What's really happening is this, right? Your atriums are contracting, and then your ventricles contracting. And then there's different things going on, like what's the blood doing? What's the electrical signal? So there's a couple of things to put together and to separate and to kind of know what's going on. And then in the end, you got to kind of put it all together. That's why mm -hmm. you're... Okay. <laughs> it's, yes. not, it's not easy you know it just for me you know once you get it it's like okay it's very easy but as you're learning it you got to put everything together like slowly walk through everything and then once you understand all the pieces kind of put it all together i, I have the page mail it's 560 on the text oh, thank you so much you're oh, on the text okay yeah. and remember they'll say things like your these fibers over here, like the conduction fibers, just I mentioned specific things in my slides, like the AV, your SA, AV bundle, your AV bundles, your Purkinje fibers. So just kind of also before maybe you read the book, just go over the slides real quick and see which ones you want to pay attention to. Okay. Mm -hmm. right, and then remember the connective tissue, which I didn't go over in Zoom, but which are in the lectures, just that, you know, they're insulating these, this whole strip so that this signal can pass without, you know, causing a contraction around this bundle right here for these particular specialized conductive cells. Can you say that again? I, uh, so there's a signal going down the interventricular septum that's going to mm -hmm. carry the signal from your AV, AV node down to your Purkinje fibers at the apex. Yeah. You, you don't want these cells contracting yet around here because this is muscle cells around here. You know, uh, so in order to do that, you have to keep these cells insulated from the rest of the surrounding stuff. They're not directly connected. Mm -hmm. These particular fibers, uh, you know, cells, muscle cells, modified muscle cells, conductive cells, aren't connected to the muscle contractile cells around them. Mm -hmm. That will, so see how they go down. And then at this point, the signal will spread and then they can spread the signal uh, in an upward fashion. But down here, you want to keep them insulated. And that's part of the one of the functions I mentioned of the connective tissue of the heart, the fibrous skeleton of the heart. The, um, uh, those, uh, the bundles? Yes. Yeah, they're traveling within that tissue over there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, within the cardiac tissue. It's all passing through because, you know, the electrical signals are going through. But these are, let's see, you know, when it, here's the fibrous skeleton I mentioned a couple I highlighted so different things. It, so it insulates the uh, atrium uh, and cyclum, but I also just mentioned the other thing, you know, because you, you want the heart, the upper chambers, then the lower chambers, and you don't want that signal to spread. So that's insulation. I think it's a little more clearer of the, you know, looking and, down the interventricular septum, but it's doing the same thing here. Yeah. And it reinforces the cardiac valves. Yeah, the valve right here. It surrounds it with these okay. fibrous rings and then reinforces them. Okay. So those, those are the things that might you know come up. Right? And these are the that's what I'm talking about. This the blue in blue here is part of that fibrous skeleton. And if you look it up online, that's all they'll talk about. But you know, I want to mention that electric insulator is actually a more important function, I think. All right. And then, you know, there's some slides about that. All right cells going down and then and how and i feel like this was mentioned but i'm not sure is the the heart isn't connected or is it to the rest of the nervous system like well, to, so that, or does that it just, is, you know your your heart can do this all by itself you could take it out of the heart you can take it out of the body and you could put it in appropriate fluid and it'll just sit there and pump in the sequence more or less oh yeah so these are auto rhythmic it, it's got its own pacemaker. It does it by itself at a normal pace. However, sometimes you want to increase it. Sometimes you want to decrease it. So in that case, all this parasympathetic and sympathetic response 
we'll do that in a complicated way. I didn't talk about the specific way about that, but you know, you could influence the pace of the SA node as well as downstream elements with through innervation. So you can kind of change a little bit that normal pace of the heart or a baseline pace of the heart increasing or decreasing or with adrenaline through the heart itself. Some of these kind of pictures, uh, if they're more clear than the models I'll use on the practical, you know, but they should, you should just get the general pattern right here of all these blood vessels. The main ones coming right off the artery, the aorta are the big ones. And then a couple of the ones that should be pretty obvious at this point, because you know that this is the brachial region What's the artery? The only tricky ones might be that those superficial ones, your basilic, you can see them if you just look up cephalic vein or something. Phlebotomy for the win. What's that? Phlebotomy for the win. <laughs> because you get to know where they are to poke them. Oh yeah, right. So, I mean, I want a real picture because it's, you know, you can see it. I had a great picture of this guy. But, I mean, your hair is like the veins on your, your arm, medial cubital, and all that stuff. That's where you. Mm -hmm. Those are good to know. Definitely, I, I mentioned in the video. Uh, oh, here's like a cadaver picture of all those. Uh, there's a couple of pressure points for your arteries. There they go. Where you could feel your pulse. Not over here, right? Obviously, you know, you know this. Your common carotid. Well, here, your brachial, your radial artery, and also, so two things just to feel the pulse itself. And, you know, if you have a really bad wound over here, where can you stop? Where's the best place to stop blood flow toward that region, right? Distally, like your femoral artery right here. If you have some kind of, if your leg gets bitten off by a shark, right? P applying direct pressure. Mm -hmm. To these, well, I guess if your leg got bitten up by a shark at that point, tourniquet might be <laughs> appropriate, but you get the idea, right? These are all places you could actually, you know, you can feel this on yourself right under, you know, kind of nest, press your fingers hard right under below your thumb right there. Yeah. You can feel your radial artery right there. Makes sense. Radial bone on the thumb side. See, it all comes, keep from coming back to that stuff. All interconnected, believe it or not. <laughs> All right. Um, there was one thing I wanted to ask is that I noticed on the exams you often have questions about like clinical applications of stuff. Um, where would I learn that? Because, like, what would I look at to study to find those things? Well, sometimes I talk about them loosely, but usually what it's about principle so that. I'm giving you, um, you don't have, you never, it's possible you could have never heard about this particular clinical disease, but you should, if you know, for instance, that, okay, I'm going to tell you there's a disease or there's a condition or somebody has gotten their uh, cephalic vein uh, cut off right there. How is blood going to get back to the heart? And you're going to be like, oh, it just, you know, gets rerouted through the, you know, basilic and goes back into here or goes through your brachial vein or something like that you know you don't have to know specifics about it it's a kind of like applied knowledge like if you never heard about it mm. but your knowledge of anatomy would allow you to answer it so i'm giving you enough information so long as you understand you know a couple of key concepts okay. for any of that stuff and a lot of them i do kind of casually mention in class like there especially with the respiratory stuff i was a little bit we, we kind of went into that a little bit more that's definitely more you know, clinically.